Simon has a long-standing belief in the power of youth, and he's here to reflect on his experience when it comes to uplifting people to create something really big. Please welcome Simon McKean. Well, thanks very much, Hannah. It's a long way to look at the news here. Um, thanks very much, Hannah and Charlie. This is a really interesting day for me. Um, I'll make a confession to you. It's not the first time I've spoken to a group, but you'll hear in a moment that um, it's the first time I've spoken this way. And I want to make a point about that in a few minutes. Um, but I'm happy, uh, you know, I'm a self-confessed dinosaur. I, um, I work in the world of business and as Hannah just described, wander around all sorts of various, I guess, facets of, um, of human life. But at the end of the day, there's a younger generation, I'm staring at you now, who are much more adept at technology, what's come along in recent years, than I ever will be. I rely on people like you to literally keep me going. And as I'll share with you in just a few minutes or so, I'm doing this talk not behind a podium with a microphone over there, but just out here by myself. And even though I do lots of speaking, I feel, this is probably the wrong terminology, but I feel quite naked before you at the moment. I normally have sheets of paper in front of me with all sorts of notes. I don't read them, I sort of kind of don't have to, but I feel quite insecure at the moment relative to what I, but I want to come back because I can actually use that point in a way that um, I want to. I have been looking forward to this day for a long time. Sandro came to talk with me many, many moons ago. And he's not the first young, talented person to do so, to talk about something that he had in mind. But I've got to say, when he started talking about the need for change, nothing new about that. Lots of people like you want to change for the better. But the way in which he was dealing with a very, very, very big issue, you know, the future of the world, sustainability, call it what you like, and at the same time injecting a very strong dose of positivism, that really got my attention. I have been involved in many, many, many protests before, um, trying to change things. And so much over my small career, it's been about trying to knock someone's lights out to point out that we have been wrong. You have been wrong. We've got to change. And there's been an element of, um, of aggression or calling to account. But what I liked about Sandro's concept was we're going to deal with something very big, and I need to spend a minute or two on that in a moment too. Probably something never as big as the human species has ever thought about before or encountered. We're still at a time where things are relatively comfortable. And accordingly, there needs to be a different way of making all of us, not just you who are committed people, plainly, if you're here, I know a tiny bit about you without even talking to you. And in many respects, it's not about you, it's about everybody else that's out there. In many respects, I'm the meat in the sandwich today. We've already heard, uh, I sat in the last two presentations, and I've heard uh, an awful lot about uh, teams and themes. And I know that following me, you're going to learn a bit more about some of the modern technical advantages that, uh, that are open to you to get messages out there. In many respects, and it's funny, actually, I guess it's a, a conference about th uh, food. I feel like a bit of the meat in the sandwich because I'm going to help transition a little bit from teams and themes and what have you to this modern technology. But as we transition through that, if I'm really left with anything, it's what is the message itself? What is the central message? What's needed at this time to be communicated? You know, it's interesting, humanity has over the eons encountered all sorts of um, massive issues. We've had uh, famines and disease, acts of God, floods, pestilences, um, 
world wars, genocide, today terrorism, all sorts of big things. When you think of them, they're essentially, in the scheme of things, short term. I mean, they're not really short term, they sometimes take a long time or years to play out. But I would suggest that they pale into insignificance with, with the issue of how the heck do we as a species keep going on this planet indefinitely, certainly for the next few hundreds of years. We don't like talking about long term futures. The Chinese do it pretty well, but very few else do. We kind of, you know, I come from the corporate world. A five year corporate plan is so long as to almost be irrelevant. And as a species, the reality is we don't think particularly long term. And yet the issue of the day, how do we keep going, to put it bluntly, is all about the long term. And it's even worse than that, because never before has such a high proportion of humanity actually done reasonably well. We've heard before about the challenges of the uh, overseas aid sector, and I for one know that We've got an enormous job to do, particularly with what we've lost here in the last uh, couple of years or so. But the reality is that when you look at the seven billion humans, we've never had such a high proportion of people who are experiencing everything from uh, a lengthening age span, better food, water, security, access to energy, housing, etc., etc., etc. And so it's actually easy for many of us to just turn on the tap in the morning, have the toast or whatever and feel, you know, I don't understand all this stuff about where is humanity going because it's basically all working for me. It is. And it is so hard to take a minute or two in a so-called busy life to reflect about not just a year or two ahead, but a decade, 50 years, a century or so particularly knowing that what we are doing today inextricably affects that, or what we're not doing today inextricably affects that future. And so against that backdrop, I'm left as this meat in the sandwich, if you like, wanting to dwell a little bit, not on technologies, you're looking at the wrong guy to help you there. We've already heard lots about teams and building up, but. What's this thing called the message? What is the message? How do we promote sustainability, to put it bluntly? I've already talked ever so briefly about where are we today? Actually, not always the case. Many are suffering enormously, but overall, the world has never been in better shape. Makes it hard to change makes it very, very hard to change, particularly if you're a type of person that is not interested in changing and feeling relatively comfortable. And I guess what I'd like to do today briefly is just emphasise three things. Firstly, the need for anyone involved in this sector to have passion. And you know what? I'm not even going to really talk about it. I've got two other things I want to dwell on. The reason I don't want to talk about it is that you people have introduced to me passion. I actually have an office up the other end of town and I sit in an open plan environment surrounded by 25 year olds. It's where I choose to be. You people teach me where the world is going and you absolutely, literally every day of the week, inject into me a dose of passion that an old bloke like me desperately needs. I wanted to talk about a couple of other things. The first, I guess, is um, the issue of this long-term campaign that you have, that we have before us. I, when I was trying to think, how can I compare it to something in the past, it's actually quite challenging. I go back to Wilberforce with slavery. It took him decades, he and his team, to actually effect change. And it was interestingly, if you are in any way interested, he had to change along the way. There were different techniques that he employed, the community came from a different place every now and then, the politicians changed, blah, blah, blah. So for a long-term campaign, the one thing that's really obvious is be prepared to change. Be prepared to listen. Where are we at? What's needed? What's working? What's not working? But it's not just a shock and awe campaign. We have a huge problem. Something's blowing up. We need to fix it. No. 
much bigger enduring long-term problem than that. And can I just say, when I opened up, I said, I feel awkward, I feel naked, I don't do this. No, I don't. Normally what I do is hide behind a lectern. And I've got 10 pages of paper here. I don't actually read speeches, but they're my security blanket. And you can't see half of me. That's how an old bloke typically gives a lecture. But Sandra wouldn't allow me to do that. You know, there's all this TED stuff nowadays, and yep, I've seen Steve, Steve Jobs in action. I've watched him. I've often said, well, that's good. That's him, not me. But I knew today that if I stood over there and just read a whole lot of notes that you'd be all sleeping. Perhaps you are anyway, I really can't see you. But, you know, the point is that change is important, particularly for a long-term and challenging campaign about the very future of... Um, of this world. And the final thing I just want to emphasise is, and it has been emphasised previously in the last two presentations, and I'm glad it has, I don't feel challenged because it's so damn important. And that is the message, the message is not what I want to tell the world or what you want to tell the world to provoke and lead to sensible change. It's what the world actually needs to hear. And there's a bit of a problem there because I feel comfortable talking to you about what I know I don't necessarily feel comfortable about what I don't know, but what the world needs. It just requires more work. And I guess I wanted to tell a couple of stories ever so quickly. The first was something that just happened to us last night. My wife and I went to a Melbourne Theatre Club production just a few hundred metres from here. It was a thing called Last Man Standing. It was, the, um, it was really just a... Uh, a, celebra a theoretical celebration this year by the government of the centenary of the Gallipoli. And uh, they were putting on a big concert and they had all the sorts of uh, great acts that you would, you know, Farnham and ACDC and all that sort of stuff. But, and this bit doesn't make sense, it doesn't matter, it was theatre, but they actually stumbled across the last living person who was at Gallipoli, you can kind of tell it doesn't work because he, he, they said that he was 15 when he went there, so he'd have to be 115 now, it doesn't work. Don't worry about that. The point is that they found this person. He could still speak, he was compass and what have you, and they wanted to make him the gala act at the very, very end. And he would simply read a few of his letters, heartfelt letters to his parents back then. And it was a great play because it was all about, you know, the government wanted to celebrate the birth of a nation and the, the fact that it was a noble campaign. Didn't quite go according to the book, but, you know, they were celebrating that Anzac myth. And this old codger got up at the very, very end, threw his notes away and said, yeah, I was there, I was 15. I was led there under false pretenses, you know, we all felt we were going off to do a little war and then spend the next year or two in Europe, a cheap way to get to Europe. And it was just absolutely awful. And his job on one of those awful days where they went over the top into a hail of bullets, literally a minute before they went over the top, he was handled a pistol by his sergeant. And he said, now, mate, you're not going over the top, you're staying just here in the trench. And your job is to shoot the guys that come back because they're scared. And he had a minute to think about it. And you can imagine what happened because the countdown, that awful countdown occurs. Over the top go these soldiers into a hail of bullets, just absolute carnage. And of course, reasonably, a handful come back having stared death in the face. His job was to shoot them dead. Cowards. And he completely stuffed up the government's intention to celebrate 100 years of, of Gallipoli by telling that simple little story. And the fact that he couldn't shoot his mates dead led to his court-martial. And all I can say is that this big issue that we're dealing with at the moment, sustainability, is not about getting the words right and going off to some really good ad agency and the glitter and blah, 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 blah. But as has been so, said so strongly before me, truth is important. That young kid went over to Gallipoli because there was an era when you could get away with stuff. You can't do that 
anymore. You people are too clever. The other thing I ever so quickly want to wind up with is I was humbled four years ago to be Australian of the Year. I gave 250 speeches all around the country and um, I was supposed to give one in a western suburb of Sydney, St Mary's. And it was a wonderful opportunity to celebrate the opening or the refurbishment of an old bowling club being taken over by a non-for-profit group which was focused on looking after delinquent kids that had been, for one reason or another, kicked out of their homes. I was looking forward to it. I'd had a bit of a connection with it anyway. Two weeks before I was supposed to go there, my EA, my assistant, came in and said, I've cancelled that speaking engagement. I said, why? I'm looking forward to it. She said, well, you've actually been invited to lunch with the Queen at Government House here in Victoria, and it's pretty obvious what you want to do. And I said, oh. But there were reasons why I had to honour that commitment, which aren't relevant today. So I said, you know what, it'd be nice to have lunch with the Queen and a few other people, but no, I've got to do that. So that morning, I get up at 4.30 and get on the six o'clock plane, I was grumpy with a capital G. I get to Sydney, had to do one or two other things, hopped in a cab, went so far west, out towards Mount Druitt and what have I felt I was going to Perth, it just went on and on and on. We finally got to this refurbished bowling club. And here was this wonderful organisation healing fractured relationships in this community. But my heart sank, I started to get pretty grumpy, I'd got up far too early and uh, and I looked at the running sheet, there were nine speakers. There was the mayor, the previous mayor, the mayor who was going to be the mayor next year, three councillors, a bunch of people that wanted to say their piece. And I'll be critical here, but the fact was their speeches were boring. They trotted out statistics about all this and all that. And I was the very last speaker. I knew I was missing lunch with the Queen. And then the speaker before me got up. She was an 18-year-old, young, unmarried woman with a two-year-old on her hip, and all she did was tell her story. And her story, which I don't need to go into detail, was about the fact that she'd been kicked out of her home and all that sort of stuff on the streets, and fortunately had been embraced by this organisation, and she had a future. I don't have to tell the story in detail, but what I will say is that you could hear the proverbial pin drop. Yes, you could. She obliterated everything else that had been said before. She obliterated me and I hadn't even said anything. I threw my notes away, I went up to the podium and said, you have heard all you need to hear today. And somehow, as the older generation in me passes to you the baton of enormous responsibility for making up for our mistakes, and I can only apologise, we ain't done enough, we've sat on our hands, the last few decades. But I actually believe very, very fervently, because many of you are my friends, that you are actually a generation notwithstanding the most extraordinary challenges that humanity has ever faced. It's not a world war. It's not an outbreak of an epidemic. It's something different. A little bit mysterious for many of us. But the issue of just getting on and being able to inhabit this earth is the biggest challenge we've ever had. You're going to have to use all of your exciting creativity, the positivism of this get together, smart ideas, because actually an element of it's going to have to be, we need to make it, might sound odd, fun. It needs to be doable, not threatening. We'll have plenty of opportunity for that but we need to find that way forward for the world so it just feels natural. It's the obvious thing to do. And all I can say as someone who's retiring from this earth sometime over the next 20 or 30 years, all the very best of luck. Thank you.